Hey, Jersey students. Uh, we're fortunate, fortunate enough to have Curtis Radney join us uh, as we have a conversation on racial reconciliation. Curtis is one of our high school ministry grow group leaders, and we're excited just to talk for a little bit. So, Curtis, what are some of your experiences that you've had in your life that maybe some of our Jersey students have not experienced? Well, when I was growing up, my neighborhood was uh, almost evenly mixed black and white. So when I was, all my friends were black and white, we all were just a bunch of friends. Nobody looked at color, never thought anything about it. And then when I moved to Groveport and in the eighth grade, and that whole school system was, was just completely white. So it was, I think maybe in my high school, all the way till high school, it was five black kids in the school. And everybody that I played on the football team, everybody seemed to be friends with us. But then there was a confrontation that we got into with football teammates in our hallway when a white player bumped into one of the black guys on our team. Now, before this point, we thought we were all friends. So all the white guys jumped on the white guy's side. So it was them against like three black guys in the hallway. And then he started, they got the shiver match and he just all of a sudden called him the N-word. And that was like the like one of the first times I've heard anybody actually say it out loud. I've read it, you know, you've heard it, but when he actually said it in a derogatory manner, um, it was like, I don't know, it was almost like a a switch that got hit, flipped, and it was like a big fight. And the, the guy, guy I was with, I was a smaller guy. He was a lot bigger, and um, it was really a uh, violent fight just in that, that hallway before they broke it up. And I just remember almost, it was like so upset that I almost like, I don't remember doing it, almost like a blackout rage. And, but I didn't get in trouble because I got pulled back really quick. My friend that didn't start the fight got suspended for the year. So no matter if he didn't cause it, the other guys have more people, but he got suspended. So then that's how the high school went. Um, we got into our think about it, the guys that who are, we think that they're friends really have this like other side to them that they can just, like they know they have a trigger word they can use to actually make us upset whenever they feel like it. And like black people, we didn't have that against white people. So they did something, we couldn't say anything back. So it was like, we were always like on edge, wondering how they actually felt about us. And like we can be friends with them. But then after I, when I got to be 16, um, when I was in high school, my mother told me there was like, since we was almost all white girls in the neighborhood, um, and some people that we don't know now, my wife is white. So my mom told me um, when I was going out to watch out for those white girls. And I didn't understand what she meant. And I was thinking, hey, we're all friends. But she was talking about her, the, the girl's parents, because a lot of the parents didn't like what they would not have their, their daughters even associating with black people. So my father had to sit down and explain that. And they had to tell me, because I got my driver's license, and they had to explain to me how to act when, if I'm driving, I'm probably gonna get pulled over at some point. And they had to show me what I have to do when a cop approaches my car and I keep my hands on the steering wheel. If I usually talk to my friends in slang, like a lot of people do, that I better switch back to regular English, um, be the most polite, because I have to be twice as good as a white person has to be. So, I got to be 16 and 17. I got driving through my neighborhood. I got pulled over. The police officer said, is it okay if I check your car for drugs? And I was thinking, I was thinking that that was just a normal thing. So I said, okay. And he went through my car and looked at my truck. And everybody told me later on that if he happened to be, if he was a cop with a grudge, he could have planted something in my car. So that was, they were like, as I was going and getting older, they were explaining these things to me. So my father has a uh, body shop in Bexley, and I work for him. Um, I was the person I drop off cars back to the customers, back and forth. So I would have to take a customer's car 
drive through Bexley to their house, to the customer's house. And I constantly was, every time I drive down through Bexley, a uh, police officer would every, at least three times a week was pull out and start following me until I would drive all the way through the neighborhood. And then one night when I was driving my father's car, the police officer actually stopped me and I did everything my parents told me. Um, I asked him why I was being pulled over and he wouldn't tell me to after he ran everything through the computer. He gave me back my license and said, well, well, you know, a guy like you driving a car like this, you just can never be too short and sent me on my way. So that's how, when I was growing up, that's, be, that's by the time I was 18. And even year, right years after that, when I met my wife, that I let her borrow my car and it had, you know, I had tenant windows. It was an old car and my father had the paint shop. So he painted it really nice. She drove through Bexley, no, not Bexley, I'm sorry. She drove my car to her, she had a job in Dublin. She drove with it through Dublin, got pulled over by the police, and they told her the tent was too dark. But at first, they rolled up, pulled up to her, and then they were shocked when she rolled the window down because it wasn't a black guy in the car. And they told her the tent was too dark, and she told him, no, my boyfriend checked it, it's okay. So he looked at everything, checked the plates, and she said, and the cop told her, I don't want to see this car in this neighborhood again and let her go and that's that's the kind of like we were constantly being harassed follow when we drive through neighborhoods um followed home from we used to go to the dance club me and my wife and we get pulled over um not getting tickets or anything so it was like that we we couldn't we didn't understand like we, we considered that why did are they just singling me out and black people out and it kind of you know it puts you on the edge to make you wonder how you how other people who are of different race actually look at you like they smile to your face but are they really doing that just because they're in your face and are they a different way when you're not around and i and i i carry those insecurities with me now thank you wow um what are what are what is something that you wish jersey students knew about this issue um, one of the, the big things, um, this was, it was a reason when I left my previous church, it was like some other things that I had an issue with, but one of the, the bigger topics was, um, um, when football players were taking a knee from national anthem and everybody got so upset about it. And the reason I'll, I'll go to the beginning of it, that when Black people were slaves. When they the, the way the way they protested was singing, singing hymns and praying, and they got beat, and murdered, raped as slaves. Then Martin Luther King Martin Luther King came and he taught peaceful protests. They marched in the streets peacefully, and they and and the police set the let the dogs out on them, put, uh, sprayed them with hoses. So that was their answer to the peaceful protests. So now we have a um, Kaepernick came with a during the national anthem um, protesting the exact same things that we're doing now and he said I am I am dismayed by what's going on in America and so he would take a knee silently nobody even noticed at first but somebody in the news noticed it brought it to the forefront and said he's disrespecting America and disrespect and he's being unpatriotic and so everybody, I could understand, I understand what he was talking about. Everything that we tried to do in the past, that it didn't work. So now he tries something like, I'm just, I'm not um, being unpatriotic or anything. I'm ashamed that America for its treatment of black people and other people couldn't understand. They're like, what are you talking about? You're privileged, you're a millionaire. You, you made it to the NFL, there's black players. How are you guys? Um, not being i mean how you underprivileged and he was what he was trying to do was use his position to stand for us and half america felt that that was wrong because he was protesting in a way that they didn't like which is funny because that's what a protest is you're supposed to the you know, protest causes disruption or something people used to protest and block a street forcing traffic to go in a different direction 
he protested silently and now he was like kicked off of football teams, lost his career. And people don't understand. They're like, you know, when the Black Lives Movement started, um, there was they were saying Black Lives Matter, and then other people are start answering All Lives Matter. But if you think about it, when a fire truck comes to a neighborhood and because the house is on fire, I'm sure all those houses matter. But should a fire truck sprinkle water on all the houses because all houses matter? No, if they sprinkle the fire on the house that's on fire because it's on fire. Same thing with Black Lives Matter. All lives matter, but Black lives are in danger right now. And that's why they need. And one other thing that I was thinking about was that the, being a, when you're in a position of privilege, you're like, a, you can be a shield for the person that doesn't have a voice, like black people that are underprivileged that uh, Kaepernick was trying to do, he was trying to be a shield, use his position of influence to be a shield. I think that's something that other people could do that, are, that have a privilege. So I, I just have one, one other question for you, e. Curtis. Yes. How has uh, coming to faith in Christ in your life, how has that changed your view on this situation? Um, or just maybe any thoughts you've had along the way? One of the things that before I became a Christian, that I would see these things, I would, I would listen to um, music, it was political music. Um, it would fill my head with like me, causing me to want to get revenge at things. Like I wasn't violent. My revenge was when I got pulled over by a police officer or something, I would want to wish I would know where he lived so I could like maybe egg his car, toilet paper his tree or something like that. But it was like, I would get angry and want to get revenge. And, and what, that's what I can understand that now when people are looting, I don't, I don't agree with looting, setting fires, none of that stuff. I get just, but I know what happens when you don't have Christ in your life, where that anger can take you. And after I became a Christian and I let, I, my whole thing is when I say become a Christian, it's like they lowered Jesus' authority over me. So now I, I realize that God is in charge. He's, he's in control. Nothing, none of this is out of his control. And when I feel anger, I could have that anger in me, but now I can, at some point, I have to take that anger and lay it at the feet of the cross and give it to Jesus. And I can, and I can pray about it. And a lot of people that, that pray, I think about biblical prayer that when they saw injustice or something was going on, um, they didn't just do a, a quick little prayer before they had their meal or anything. They cried out to pray, cried out to the Lord and they rent their clothes. And um, it was like a, a drawn out prayer full of sorrow. And it was so heartfelt. And that's what, that's the way I think about now that when I try to, when I see things, things going on, that now I can bring it to the cross and know that it's a burden that I have, but I don't need to carry that burden anymore of this hate and anger that I can lay at the feet of Jesus. And I know Jesus will give me peace about it. And also that um, there's a verse that it was uh, uh, Ephesians 6.12. Yeah, Ephesians 6.12. It was uh, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, against power, but the powers and principalities. And I know that this, what's going on now is just, it's a physical manifestation of a spiritual problem. That everything that we try to do is a, a physical cure, but we need to reach the root, the, the spiritual root of these physical cure problems that we have. So I think that's what I've learned since when I become a Christian, that now that I'm like, a, Satan is actually using this situation and stoking a situation more to, uh, I'm thinking he's drawing people away from Christ, trying to call, cause discord when we need to bring Christ, introduce more people to Christ, a better way to say it. And I think that's the cure. That's the only true cure for the problem that we have. Definitely. Thank you so much, Curtis, for your time. And, and students, I would encourage you to ask, ask Curtis more questions. Learn, learn from him and, and listen and, and just gain some understanding on things that he's experienced. So. Thank you so much, Curtis. Uh, you're welcome.